Hi, I'm Guy Mussey, Horticultural Extension Agent with Virginia Cooperative Extension in Stafford County, Virginia. And this is another in a series of uh, videos, instructional videos that we'll be doing on all things gardening, dealing with anything horticultural or entomological. Uh, we hope to do several of these and maybe at some point even do another Q&A session where you can uh, write in uh, your questions uh, in the comment section and we can answer them or even uh, live. Um, so today we're going to try something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to talk about planting the right plant in the right place. Now this is not a landscape design class, but many times I know people will go out, they'll go, in, especially this time of year, they'll go to a, a garden center, to a nursery, they see a beautiful plant in bloom, uh, and they've just got to have it, they bring it home, and they have absolutely no idea where they're going to put it. This takes some thought to get a good uh, 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 landscape uh, design, or at least to have it looking nice. You don't want to just place plants that you like and have it look like what I call botanical zoo, or like the measles, so to speak, with just plants scattered everywhere. So today we're going to talk about the right plant, right place, and uh, this again has more to do with the plant thriving where you're going to put it, the conditions um, around the plant. Okay, so we all know that trees and shrubs enhance the beauty and value of our homes, even our communities. However, if they're not planted, if they are planted in the wrong spot, they can actually be a, a detriment to the environment and to our landscaping. Uh, they can cause property damage, uh, create uh, all kinds of issues uh, with uh, different problems. So the planting location species will ensure that the plant uh, will be an asset and not be a hazard or a nuisance. Uh, essentially, you need to figure out what you're going to what you want out of there. Here's a, an example of someone that created a beautiful uh, outdoor room where they can go out and they have, they have privacy there. There's shade, um, and they can use it just like they would inside their house as long as the weather permits. Uh, they can read a book or uh, have people over. Uh, so you know, if you plant them uh, uh, correctly, you can create an environment like that if that's what you're going for. There are five considerations when you're dealing with a right plant, right place. Uh, the first is purpose. What do you want to create out there? Don't just get a plant and put it anywhere. Uh, the soil conditions that you're going to be planted in, that's very important. Uh, the location, in other words, the right place. The species growth and form, the plant that you're actually planting would be the right the right plant and then we also want to talk a little bit about some undesirable uh, species traits in some of the plants uh, that you just love but they have problems and we want to talk about that you might not want to use them because of the problems so let's first talk about purpose uh, trees and shrubs as we know provide uh, many benefits they can provide shade obviously that's the most obvious thing a color you can get fall color spring color even uh, summer color if you're using a uh, crepe burn or something. Vertical dimension obviously is a, a, an important aspect. Uh, you can use plants and shrubbery as uh, soundproofing. If you live near a highway or a high school for that matter, you won't want to muffle the sound coming from those areas. Uh, you can plant for cooling purposes in a hot summer uh, to shade your house, your patio, your porch. Uh, obviously we're going to plant for beauty, uh, maybe for screening. Okay, you might want to uh, screen out a, an area that is not very appealing that's next door or behind your house. Uh, so you want to plant something so you won't see those areas. You can also plant for windbreaks. And you want specific plants that will uh, help uh, mitigate that and stop the wind uh, on your patio or in your backyard or wherever you want. People all the time plant for pro boundary lines and they'll put hedges and different things up to identify their boundaries. And of course, uh, another purpose that uh, not everyone does, but it's certainly worthy to think about is for wildlife habitat. The only thing I want to say about wildlife habitat, yes, we want the butterflies, uh, we want the uh, frogs and the toads and the uh, squirrels and the various wildlife, but keep also in mind that when you're attracting wildlife, there's some wildlife you might not want to attract like rats and mice and moles, uh, voles and snakes. So you got to make sure what you want and what the result's going to be when you plant. 
okay? Uh, we talked about, uh, so, so mentioned about soil conditions. That is absolute paramount when you're planting a plant. Uh, some plants like acid soils, some like uh, more uh, sweeter soils at a higher pH. Uh, you got to make sure you know what you have there. Uh, and of course, I would recommend before you do any planting that you take a soil test. <coughs> they do do soil tests for like $10 at Virginia Tech. And uh, they, uh, they will send you back a report, uh, which will give you uh, the uh, amount or conditions of various elements like potassium and magnesium. Uh, calcium, but the most important parameter they will give you is pH. So if you have plants, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you have plants, for instance, um, that like a lower pH, like some of your ericaceous plants, like rhododendron, azaleas, pieris, andromeda, what have you, uh, you don't want to plant them out in the middle of the yard where you have grass growing, which like it's a higher pH. Uh, also, the uh, moisture conditions. You've got to make sure that you're planting the right plant for that. If you have a low-lying area in your backyard, uh, you wouldn't want to plant an upland uh, tree, for instance, like an oak or an ash. Uh, they like drier conditions, uh, so they might drown essentially over the years, and uh, you know it could be very detrimental. Could even kill them out, uh, in time if you plant them in those conditions. Then again, plants that generally thrive in low lying conditions like birch, sycamore, uh, red maple, uh, hornbeam, uh, they usually can do quite well in drier conditions uh, because the, 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 the point of them being in low lying conditions, the reason they do so well isn't because they need lots of water, but it's because they can grow well in low oxygen conditions. That's why you might see sycamores growing or, or red maples in a parking lot where there's very little water getting to them, compacted soils, but uh, very low uh, oxygen, oxygen conditions in those areas, and they'll do quite well. So you got to make sure that you got the right plant in the right place. Some plants will thrive in clay conditions. Some need more sandy soils. The next consideration that you need to look at is the location. Uh, you may have, the soil may be correct. Uh, you may have it in the, the you, the right purpose and all, but the location is important, the right place in other words. Uh, first of all, you gotta make sure that if it's a sun-loving plant, you want it in full sun. If it's something that likes partial shade uh, or partial sun, that you have it in those conditions, uh, as well as those that grow in uh, the true deep shade. Uh, I talked about this to in a little more extent in one of my previous uh, uh, videos, and you can go back and look at those where we're talking about actual light conditions. But these are important, and usually on the label of the plant that they will tell you if it's full sun, partial shade, partial sun, and uh, or shade. Or par um, uh, just keep in mind, if it's full sun, it needs at least six hours of direct sunlight. Uh, partial shade to partial sun is about uh, four hours up to six hours, and then shade, you don't want to go over three hours of full sun, although they can handle some sun mostly. Okay. You want to also consider the ultimate size of the plant. How often have I seen, and I get calls at the office all the time, about a problem they're having with a tree or a shrub that was planted 10 years ago, 5 years ago, whatever, uh, and it looked fine where it was at the time, and now it's overgrown and they don't know what to do with it. They need to prune it, uh, move it, or do something. So you've got to keep in mind ultimate size. You also need to know what kind of root type you have. If you have a, a plant that's going to have a lot of surface roots, you may not want it near your drain field um, or near a sidewalk or a patio that it could actually lift those as it grows. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, you also want to look at moisture uh, requirements. Uh, here's a, a slide that shows the wrong place. And this is what is often done. It's just a simple uh, drawing showing a driveway and a garage with a nice little tree planted. It looks great right there. It looks like it would belongs there. They wanted it to grow, uh, evidently, to shade the garage, shade their car. Um, but they didn't think about how, when it got big, what it's going to do. The limbs are getting into the garage. They had to be maintained and, and pruned out. Roots then would migrate into the driveway and crack it the walk there, not to mention that if there was snow and you had a plow going, uh, the, the base of the tree can get nicked or, or banged up from it. So again, ultimate size, uh, the location is so important. Moving that tree 
uh, 10 feet away from that sidewalk and that driveway would be the better uh, uh, place to put it. But as you see, you know, it's young. I've seen people t buy rhododendrons or azaleas and plant them in the front of their uh, picture window, looking out through the front yard. Uh, it looks great, beautiful when they bloom there. But in about five or six years, they're coming up over and blocking their site through the window. And then they got to get and hack at the uh, rhododendron or the plant to, to keep it down so they can look out. So you need to look at ultimate size. Uh, it's so important when you're planning for something. Here's something, uh, the next slide showing some root problems. You see that, I call that a little tree lawn or the apron, the area between the sidewalk and the uh, uh, curb. This was, pictures were taken in Fredericksburg. You see this all the time in all the cities and towns uh, in the, uh, uh, where the trees were put in. They were small, looked beautiful as uh, trees along that street. And then the roots will just, they have nowhere to go. They need oxygen. They're not going to go under the, the street much, uh, so they try to grow out along that uh, apron there. And then you can see the other picture, the girdling roots is probably planted with just a narrow hole, maybe a bare root. They just uh, wand the roots around. They'll never come undone. And as they grow in girth, they can actually girdle the tree and create a real problem uh, in the future. So these are all things you need to think of at first. How about this picture? This was again taken in Fredericksburg. Nice brick walk. By the way, brick walks aren't necessarily or, or areas around, uh, uh, good areas to put around tree, good paving, because uh, as they uh, get tighter, uh, I've seen many puddles on brick walks where the water doesn't actually percolate through. So it could be just like concrete. I'm sure this tree was planted when it was small. They allowed a small little well around it. Uh, for it and now look at it. Look at the roots. It's pushing that granite um, uh, curb out. It's lifting the sidewalk. They even tried to concrete it earlier and you can see the roots just laughed at it and push it out. You can even see the little green, um, it looks like uh, some fabric that they put down there uh, maybe to keep the roots from going out into the street or pushing against it. Uh, none of that worked. The tree is going to win. And so you can see this tree is probably producing some beautiful shade for the street, for the house, but not the right tree for that. So you can see what's happening. Uh, it'll eventually have to be taken down and that's a shame after all the years it's growing there uh, and, and what it's doing. How about this picture? Yeah, you see this all the time. Trees planted under utility lines, under electric lines, what have you. Um, <laughs> It just doesn't work. When they're small, it's great. Uh, the utility company comes in, they're concerned about their lines as they should be. Uh, they're not concerned about the, the, the uh, health of the plant and so they just cut them away from their lines. And look at that monstrosity there, that mess. Uh, I don't know if that's a maple or what it was planted there, but that's certainly a wrong plant in the wrong place. You can see along the curb how big it is. They even had to curve this, the, the sidewalk around. It looks like a fairly new sidewalk, so it probably pushed up the old sidewalk and became a tripping hazard. But if you had somebody, you could see the cars planted on either side of it. If you were going to park, or I meant not planted, but parked, if you were going to park in that location and you had a passenger, they wouldn't even be able to get out of the car. So obviously you need to think in terms of, of uh, five, 10 years, 20 years down the road on how big that plant's gonna be and if it's gonna uh, interfere with anything around it, okay? Very good example. So let's talk a little bit about uh, growth and form, okay? Uh, the last talk I talked about creating a tropical uh, paradise in Virginia and I told you to, uh, you know, think outside the box and expand what you might think to use. We talked about uh, cold hardiness zones. Uh, we're in 7A. Uh, you know, and that's a good thing to think about. And certainly if you're planting for a landscape uh, in your yard, you want to keep within those boundaries. When we talked last week, we're talking about expanding it because you want to try some new things. And certainly I would suggest you do that. But in your front yard where you want a nice, uh, uh, stable uh, landscaping, you want to make sure you have the right hardiness zone. And it's not just cold hardiness. It's also uh, whether the plant can handle um, the uh, warm summers. 
for instance, uh, paper birch, which is a beautiful plant in New England. I've seen people try to grow that down here. Our summers are way too hot, and it has all kinds of problems with br uh, bronze birch borer and other things. So you got to make sure it can grow. Uh, when I was at Penn State and University of Kentucky in charge of those campuses, I always said buy in the same, uh, when you're going to buy plants, get them north of, of where you are or at least uh, in the similar uh, zone that you are. If you buy plants from a nursery that they come up from uh, an area in, that were grown in Georgia, they may not be acclimated or, or be able to grow well in your area. So cold hardiness, make sure you got the right uh, plant for that. Shape and form is important especially in our yards, especially our urban yards where they're smaller than they used to be. Uh, you've got to make sure that the plant isn't going to outgrow that area. Uh, and that does everything you, you look at. So you want the size of it, how fast it grows, and also longevity. People love these purple leaf plums uh, for the purple uh, leaves that they have and the pink flowers. But uh, if you get 12 to 15 years from them, you're doing good, they've got a lot of problems. So longevity is also a consideration. Uh, I've got some examples here of uh, size. Uh, that's a beautiful ginkgo. And, and uh, if you're a plantsman like that, and that's one of my favorite trees. It has a beautiful golden yellow in the fall. And I have seen this tree uh, when I was at Penn State, driving, uh, toward, uh, driving to work, I'd go by the state pen where they had a large driveway that went up from the road around the the penitentiary and back down lined with ginkgos and in the fall they would all turn as golden yellow and then it seemed like uh, within a few weeks uh, or a month they would all drop at the same time and it was like the whole driveway was paved with gold it was absolutely beautiful they have beautiful fall color certainly a tree worth growing but they are big trees so you surely not going to go out and purchase a uh, standard species uh, ginkgo biloba for your front yard if you live in an urban environment, okay, or community where the yards are much smaller. But there are cultivars, There's a, that's short for cultivated variety, that have certain shapes that might fit it. So if you're dead set on a ginkgo tree, you might look at the Princeton Century, which is a cultivar, a named cultivar, that you can buy that's going to be more columnar and might fit a narrow area in your yard or smaller area, but still give you the same qualities uh, that you want and characteristics that you want from the ginkgo. Okay, so you need to look at that. And the right, you know, that, that obviously I have the wrong plant in the wrong place. You can see it uh, uh, overtaking that house and then there's a narrow one in a smaller neighborhood. But here's a, a large ginkgo in a cemetery. Certainly it belongs there. I mean, as far as space goes, it's doing quite nice there. So even though that large tree is not in the right place there in town next to that house, it certainly would be in a park location or a cemetery location. So uh, again, it's not just the right plant, but the right location. Here you can see these, uh, these are uh, European hornbeans, uh, the fastigiate, that, that's a fancy word for the upright or columnar variety. Uh, they have a very narrow growth habit. Uh, you can see them uh, along a street that that's the right tree for that even though it's small it'll get big but it's not going to get as big as an oak uh, or some of the others trees that we plant along there and it has that upright growth habit so it's not going to spread out into the street so any trucks going by are going to hit and break limbs uh, it seems to be that it's going to be in the right place okay another con consideration that you might want to keep in mind uh, other than just the size or the shape of the plant uh, making sure that it fits the area that you're growing it in, also the conditions of the soil that we talked about. But it also might be something as simple as the color of the plant. Uh, in this slide, um, you can see that I have, there's a, a, a Japanese red maple there, uh, Acer palmatum, beautiful tree, sort of an artsy looking tree, free form, uh, growing in a little courtyard area there. But what's it growing against? A tree with a white stucco, stucco finish. Now think in, in terms of you might love that tree and you want one in your front yard, but if your house is a, a, a red brick house rather than a white stucco, you might want to get a green variety rather than this 
purple leaf variety or red variety that's going to kind of melt into the back ground and you not, won't even be able to see it. So you need to think of these terms on what's going to look good from the street, uh, what's growing around it, what the area looks uh, like around it. So these are certain some considerations. And then you might have an area that's very confined and you don't want, you want something planted along that walk going to the backyard. Uh, most people will plant there, but that little small area between the sidewalk and the house, uh, they will uh, plant shrubs like viburnums or something and then they have to hack them back to keep them off the walk. Uh, this is really well done. You have some edging boxwood going along there which does not grow fast and then some of these uh, uh, rocket or pencil type uh, junipers growing up that stay narrow, uh, columnar like that, break up that area around the house a little bit, nice vertical elements and a horizontal element there, but fit the site. That's the important thing. You're not going to have a lot of maintenance here in having to, to uh, shear them or prune them back uh, every year to keep them in bounds. So keep these things in mind when you're uh, picking plants. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about some undesirable species traits. So you have the right plant in the right place. Uh, you have a beautiful plant that you want. It's got plenty of room. It's got the color you want. It's going to look good there. But the final consideration is some undesirable species traits. In other words, is it prone to insect damage or disease? All right, or does it produce a lot of mess like fruits and seeds that you're going to have to clean up, a maintenance issue? All right, uh, the be most beautiful plant in the world in the right place, if you've got to spray it all the time to keep it alive, is not the right plant in the right place. And there are many plants that will have issues that you might like. Um, here an example of a hemlock, eastern hemlock, Beautiful plants. You don't see many of these in in um, in Fredericksburg area of Virginia, um, but you do see them up in the mountains of Virginia. Okay, it gets a little warm down here for them, and there is a, a an insect that has actually been devastating the uh, native population in the western part of the state, and that's the hemlock woolly adelgid. Okay, it's an insect, right? You're going to have to use pesticide to keep it off. Now, when it's, your tree is six feet tall or 10 feet tall, not a big problem if you don't mind using pesticides, all right? But when it grows to a 20, 30, 40, 50 foot tree, now you've got a problem. And it's going to get that. It, you, it's going to get that problem. It's, it's very common on hemlocks in our area. So you really might want to stay away from the eastern hemlock for that reason alone, no matter how well it fits your, the environment. Uh, another one, which you see all the time, is uh, the Bradford pear, or, and in this case, we, I have an example of uh, uh, flowering um, crab apples, okay? In Pennsylvania, they're used all the time, much overused, and uh, just as Bradford pears are used down here. Um, plants in, these, in the Malus genus and the uh, Pyrus genus, which is the pears, get fire blight. It's a bacterial disease. If we have a wet spring, it's going to happen, okay? That means that you're going to have to spray at the right time uh, when it's in bloom. Uh, you're going to have to prune out the infected limbs to keep the inoculum off. It can be a real problem with these types of plants. So you may want, want to pick a plant, no matter how desirable it is in all the other conditions, that if you don't want the maintenance of having to take care of it and spray it all the time, you might want to. And there are many other plants that do have other diseases that are host specific to them that you might not want to use. All right, how about something as simple as, uh, they're just dirty plants. Some people, I love yard work and I don't mind going out cleaning up my yard, but some people don't want that. One that comes to mind, quite uh, readily is the southern magnolia, a beautiful plant with those big uh, large white flowers that bloom all summer, T intense fragrance, nice evergreen, shiny evergreen leaves. They get real big, so you've got to make sure you have the yard for them, but they are somewhat of a dirty plant. They shed leaves all the time and you're going to have to keep them cleaned up. I have an example here of uh, mulberry. Now you don't see mulberries planted too often, but this certainly is an example. You could see a park there where they actually, somebody designed this, where they put mulberries in a park. And if you look under the trees, you'll see picnic tables, okay? Mulberries are nice trees, and the, uh, the, the berries make great wine, great jelly, what have you. But 
they're, the good spot is not over a picnic table, all right? Somebody wanting to go out when those berries are, are ripe and they're falling off, um, they're, you're going to get it on your skin, you're going to get it on your clothes, and it will not wash off. So how well the, the tree behaves in your yard uh, is certainly uh, important as far as how much uh, uh, dirt it can create or how much maintenance that you have to do. Okay, here's another one, and I'll tell you, this is one of my pet peeves, uh, Br Bradford pears. Much overused plant. Uh, we, when I was at University of Kentucky, the students called them dynamite plants because invariably in a summer storm uh, where you had a little bit of wind, they blew up. In other words, they have these very uh, cute crotches uh, between the branches, which are very weak and can be sp split out easily, and you see a picture there. Uh, of one that's split out and what it does to the tree. It takes that whole lollipop shape that people like about it away from it because half the tree is gone. And this might be after, you know, six, seven, eight years, 10 years it's been growing there, and now half of the tree is gone. What are you going to do with the rest? You're going to have to take it out and start over again. The best thing is just not to plant it. Okay, so not only does this get fire blight, a disease, but they also seem to blow up. I can drive around Fredericksburg in the middle of the summer after a good storm, and I, can, I can't count on both hands how many of these I see, half of them gone, laying along the road or in their yards. All right, so that, a tree that has a problem like that, even though it has many qualities, they have beautiful summer, uh, shiny dark green summer foliage, they have nice white flowers, they get a nice burgundy red color in the fall, some great qualities. But just because of the maintenance issues and the fact that you might lose it after so many years is a good reason to stay away from it. Okay, now that you can see that some plants do have some undesirable traits, and even though they might be the right plant for the location, the right uh, uh, area that you have, the right conditions, soil conditions, and what have you, um, they still might have problems, uh, as I showed you before, with the insects, with disease, uh, just with the genetic uh, issues that they have. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a list of some plants that... Uh, there can be possible problems. This is by no means comprehensive, and you may not agree with all these plants that I've listed. It all depends on what you want to use them for and how you're growing them. Uh, the first plant I have is American Elm with a question mark. How can that beautiful American Elm ever be a problem plant? Well, if you know anything about the history of the American Elm, it used to be small town America's shade tree along uh, the streets of every, just about every small town in America back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. That's the 1900s. <laughs> and then the Dutch elm disease came in and wiped most all of our native stands of American elm out and has become a real problem with American elm uh, today. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide or two. A black walnut, another beautiful tree. It is a large tree, but say you have a large area. If you're growing it for the nuts, go for it. It's a nice tree. But if you have it in a yard, or even a large yard, uh, you'll know what how problematic it can be with um, uh, the, the walnuts falling down. If you're not going to eat them, they can be a problem. Box elder is sort of a, a weedy tree. It is native. It's in the uh, actual, it's in the same family as uh, the uh, maples. Uh, doesn't look anything like a maple. Has, doesn't have any good fall color at all. Uh, so it can be a, an issue. It can get real weedy. Uh, the catelpa. Another tree that has uh, got nice flowers, actually, large leaves, kind of exotic looking, but it's weak wooded and it can break out in storms. The Empress tree, a beautiful tree with uh, beautiful flowers in the spring, uh, sort of stand upright like candles. Um, a lot of people like that tree for the flowers, uh, but it can be not only weedy and, uh, or I mean, I should say dirty tree, but it can also be somewhat invasive. So you wouldn't want that. Golden chain tree has a lot of issues with disease. Mimosa, another one of those that has a lot of diseases. The white and green ash. I mean, a few years ago, I would highly recommend them as nice shade trees for your yard. But now with the uh, uh, invasive uh, emerald ash borer has invaded. Uh, it's an exotic pest. Uh, it's actually a, a, a beetle. And it's wiping out millions of trees in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and it's down here in Virginia as well. So why would you plant something, even if it's a beautiful tree that you really like, that in a few years it's only there to die and you'll have to cut it down anyways? 
Uh, I mentioned the mulberry before. They can be very dirty and a problem. If you have it in the backyard and you have uh, somebody that can make pies, go for it. But certainly not over a patio. Siberian elm is a rather weedy, unkempt looking tree. Uh, silver maple. That's, that's the, uh, 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 the tree of, uh, that most contractors will put in on new construction. Usually there's a requirement to plant so many trees or shrubs around a new house that they're building. And so they'll go and put these silver maples on. They're cheap, fast growing, very much weak wooded. And they really, other than some shade, they don't have many redeeming qualities, terrible fall color, uh, and can be kind of dirty as well. Um, sweet gum. Beautiful native tree. Uh, I love it as far as that goes in, in its native habitat. In my yard, not so much. Uh, it produces those uh, gumballs that in, in the fall, and when I'm out there mowing uh, my yard, uh, it sounds like a pinball machine with them pinging off of the mower all the time. So, uh, you know, depending on how much maintenance you want, uh, but they are a gorgeous tree. Sycamore, another beautiful native. Uh, you see this growing around the area, large trees, so you better have a large area. But the reason it's on this uh, particular problem tree list is that it does get a disease called anthracnose. This is a foliar disease where it actually causes the tree to lose most of its leaves in about July. Uh, and now you've got to clean them up. When it does that year after year, the tree is greatly weakened and can eventually die. So it's probably not something you want to put in if you want long term and then, and then the uh, ubiquitous tree of heaven. That's the tree that everybody loves to hate. Uh, very invasive. Um, it's an exotic tree from uh, China. Uh, beautiful tree over there. But here, there's no na uh, 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 natural uh, predators or natural controls for it. And it is flat out, will outgrow any native flora. This is the tree that you might see growing in the inner city. Uh, Washington DC, New York, Philadelphia, whatever, and in the little alleyways behind buildings where they have all black top and then building in that little crack that's a half or an inch uh, wide between the black top and the, and, the, and the building itself, you'll see a tree coming out. That's tree of heaven. They, are, uh, they will grow just about anywhere and they will outcompete any native plant. They uh, uh, propagate like crazy. They have lots of seeds. Uh, they're uh, Roots sucker quite a bit and will move out, like what I call walking uh, away from their site. Uh, just a terribly, terribly invasive tree. And I also list the white pine. White pine is a beautiful native, and normally I wouldn't put that, uh, but I've seen people, it's a fast growing tree, and people will uh, uh, plant that for a screen uh, in their yards because it's so fast growing, but it's so large, it quickly outgrows uh, uh, the room that it has. But in, in the right condition, uh, certainly it's not a problem. All right, let's go back to those American elms, okay? I remember a day uh, when I was at Penn State, I was in charge of the campus, and I had to take care of those elms, and you can see a picture of those uh, here that uh, the, the bottom picture was taken in 1996, and that was the time or so that I was there. These beautiful trees get 100, 120 foot tall. They produce these beautiful uh, gothic uh, arch, natural gothic arch, and in the summertime, <coughs> when the leaves are out, it could be 15 degrees cooler underneath those trees than it is out in the full sun. Just gorgeous trees. But look at the top picture. That's 2008. The Dutch elm disease. That's the problem with it. The Dutch elm disease uh, is wiping out those. It's wiped out most of them uh, in the United States. Uh, and Penn State is one of the last strongholds. I think University of Wisconsin still has. Um, number and there's a few others around, but for the most part, you're not going to see them uh, anymore, especially in the cities because uh, of the Dutch elm disease. will just take them out. Uh, but if you still want one, they have are, are developing these cultivars. That's uh, short for cultivated variety. These are varieties that have shown some resistance to the Dutch elm disease. Uh, I've listed Jefferson, New Harmony, Princeton, uh, Valley Forge. These are supposed to be uh, resistant to the disease. Now, there's a lot of cultivars come out that claim resistance that are hybrids between the uh, American elm, the Chinese elm, or what have you, uh, and they're not true to form to the beautiful American elm with that very vase shape to it and the pendulous habit of the, of the um, 
limbs uh, on the outer part of the, the tree. Uh, so I would stick to one that are truly almost Americana, uh, but there are these cultivars that are somewhat proven to be resistant. So you can still grow it, and then it wouldn't be a problem tree, would it? Okay. And then let's just a couple of slides on some good choices. These are some of my favorite plants um, that should not be a problem. I have more, usually with horticulturists, they look for more than one season of interest uh, and they value those like your viburnums. Uh, but here I have some beautiful trees. I have a Japanese tree lilac. It is not invasive. It's not native, but it's not invasive. They're growing uh, right at my front door. I have it far enough from the door and the house that as it grows, it's not going to be a problem. But it gets these beautiful um, pure white uh, flowers in the spring, usually a bit later than regular lilacs uh, or the common lilac. I have the paper bark uh, maple, uh, beautiful in the summer, beautiful in the winter with that uh, exfoliating cinnamon orangish colored bark. Uh, one of my favorite pines, the Japanese umbrella pine, a beautiful texture to that. Red Buckeye uh, with those uh, reddish candle-like uh, flowers and then the Chinese pistachia. We didn't have that when I was at Penn State or the University of Kentucky, but when I moved to Virginia, I saw one for the first time at the Ginner Botanical Garden and fell in love with it. They get a fire engine red in the fall and again, uh, not invasive. Just a couple of more uh, that are good choices. The white fringe tree is a native plant and I'm telling you, uh, when that's in bloom, it is absolutely beautiful. It has these strap-like white flowers um, that uh, are absolutely gorgeous. The, um, the sourwood, uh, the sweet spire, good fall color, native, and of course the viburnums. So um, I think that's about it. Oh, and then my final tree. What about this one? Can anybody tell me out there in YouTube land what I'm showing you? What is this tree? It's actually a beautiful tree, right? And I'm a plantsman. I'm an equal opportunity plantsman. I love native plants, but I also like plants that grow around the world as well. Now, I don't want anything that's invasive, of course, but this tree is gorgeous, isn't it? If you don't recognize it, let me tell you, and don't shoot me, don't send me any bad letters, I'm just putting it in here to show you that plants don't know their reputation. This is Tree of Heaven, okay? Yeah. I remember one time I was uh, doing a tour on the University of Mary Washington campus uh, for a seminar that was going on there and I was talking about plants and I came, I had a crowd of people walking uh, alongside me looking at plants and I was showing them different things and I showed them this big beautiful tree in bloom, how gorgeous it was and there were some ladies in there and some fellows that had their mouths dropped and they were appalled and uh, of course you know, they were, they were uh, members of the Native Plant Society. I love that society, and I love what they're doing, uh, and they thought I was off my rocker. No, I was just showing them. It was a tree of heaven in bloom. It is a beautiful plant, but I do not recommend you grow it. If you have it, get rid of it. Uh, give, me, give me a call or make a comment. I can send you information on how to get rid of it. If you cut it down, it's going to walk. It's going to make it worse. If you just cut it down, there are things you have to do. You're going to have to use herbicides on this tree, but um, you know, in its native environment, you can see why it's uh, uh, called tree of heaven. Okay. Well, that's all I have for today. Again, make your comments below, uh, and if you have any questions uh, that you need, uh, give uh, take a look at our um, our website for Virginia Crop Extension, Stafford County. I'd be happy to help you and answer any of your questions. Thank you.